Hello, everyone, and welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We're in a book of Genesis. We come today to Genesis chapter 41, and we resume our study in verse 33. Genesis 41, verse 33. So grab your Bible, open it up, and get ready to study the Word of God with me verse by verse. Been doing this for 30 years teaching the Bible verse by verse from Genesis through Revelation. Have gone through the Bible three times completely, just recently finished my last, my third series through the Bible. Hope it's not my last because I started all over again in Genesis, and that's what we're doing in Genesis chapter 41 today. So you can study the Word of God at the Bible verse by verse dot com. That's the scripture verse by verse website found at the Bible verse by verse dot com. Hope you check it out. Nothing more important than the Word of God. So let's pray and get right into it. Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Genesis forty one thirty three. Pick it up right where we left off. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh look out a man discreet and wise and set him over the land of Egypt. Joseph has just interpreted Pharaoh's dream. It came from God. It was a warning that there were seven plenteous years coming, followed by seven years of very severe famine. And so Joseph's advice is uh, really an application of the word of God. And he says in verse 34, let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land and take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt in the seventh, seven plenteous years. You know, this guy, he's not shy about communicating the word of God or how to apply it, is he? That's the way a man of God ought to be. And uh, these are all good ideas from Joseph because they line up with the application of God's word. But what I like about Joseph is that he doesn't just deliver the word of God. He's trying to get the king to use God's word. It doesn't do you, to, it doesn't do you any good to know the word of God if you don't apply it. What good does it do for you to know that Jesus is the only savior, the only way to heaven, the only way to avoid hell, if you don't apply it by repenting of your sin and receiving him as your Lord and savior? And so God gave Pharaoh, king of Egypt, warning so that he would have time to repair and Joseph, prepare, I should say. And Joseph is trying to get him to move in that direction. And, you know, that was nice of God when you think about it. King of Egypt never did God any favors, but God is doing him one right here. And there's a lesson for us, isn't there? We don't have to wait for others to do something nice for us before we do something nice for them. If that's how we are, we're no better than the heathen because they do that. God is pleased when we make the first move to be nice to someone because that is how he is and that's how he is to us. And thank goodness. So Joseph, Joseph says, don't, overindulge during those seven years of plenty because trouble is coming. Save some for the lousy years. Good advice. Verse 35. And let them gather all the food of those good years that come to lay up corn and lay up corn, excuse me, and lay up corn under the hand of Pharaoh and let them keep food in the cities. And that food shall be for store to the land against the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land perish not through the famine. And the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this is, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God hath shewed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. The king notices the connection between Joseph's relationship with God and how it affects 
his character, his wisdom, and his behavior. And if it does, if your relationship, so-called, doesn't affect your character, your wisdom, and your behavior, you have no relationship with God. You have no relationship with God. Because faith without works is dead. Verse 40. Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. He just gave Joseph the authority to institute executive orders. You know what that is? The, if, if you're listening to this in America, the President of the United States, or if you're not listening to it, it doesn't matter. The President of the United States can issue executive orders. In other words, there are certain things that he can do without even the approval of Congress. All he needs is his signature. And that's the type of authority that Pharaoh just gave to Joseph. What a change! What an amazing change. I mean, I'm talking about from one day to another in the life of Joseph. And, you know, it goes right along with that phrase that we see quite often in Scripture. And suddenly. And suddenly. It sure does apply here. One minute, Joseph is a slave in prison. And the next minute, he's the second most powerful person in Egypt. You could say the second most powerful person in the entire world. And what made the difference? Did he change his behavior? No. He was always consistently a man of God. It wasn't anything that Joseph did. What made the difference then? Well, God's timing made all the difference in the world. That's it. It was God's timing. It was God's time to use Joseph in a different way. God's timing always makes the difference. 41. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand. Now, that ring wasn't just for decoration. It was a signet ring. A signet ring was sort of like a rubber stamp with the king's signature. Do you realize the power that Pharaoh just gave to Joseph? Joseph can now issue any decree that he wants to issue and sign the king's name and bang, just like that, it's law. He must have really been impressed with Joseph because he saw Joseph's God in Joseph. That's why. And then the last part of verse 42 and arrayed him in vestures of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. And the gold chain or gold necklace complemented the signet ring. It also was symbolic of authority in Egypt. And so Joseph has the power of attorney right now. He can, he can act in the place of the king. 43. And he made him to ride in the second chariot, which he had. And they cried before him, bow the knee. And he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. Now, again, those of you in the United States probably know that the president's plane is called Air Force One. The vice president's plane is called Air Force Two. Joseph's chariot was Egypt's version of Air Force Two. 44. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without thee shall no man lift up his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. In, order, in other words, by order of the king, by order of Pharaoh himself, nothing of any importance relating to anything political or anything economic can be done by anyone in Egypt, anywhere in Egypt, unless it is first authorized by Joseph. Sweeping powers given to this man that the king barely knows, but he knows him pretty well. Verse 45, And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zephaniah, and he gave him to wife Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On. And Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. So what a, 
What a change. He went from being a slave boy in a prison, unjustly accused, unjust punishment, to the second in command, married to a woman that the king chose for him personally. And Joseph's new name means one who reveals the future. One who reveals the future. Of course, Joseph didn't claim to do that. Joseph gave all the credit to God. He never claimed to be able to predict anything. God simply used him to do what he did. And Joseph knew that. You know, the Bible says that no one has anything except it, given, except it be given to them from God. We all have, we, we all owe God a great big thank you for everything that is good about us and anything good that we can do. Any skill that we have, any knowledge that we have, any ability to study, any ability to learn, any opportunities to use it, everything good that we have, anything good that we do, it deserves, God deserves the credit for giving it to us. Verse 46, And Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. Joseph had been 17 years old when his brother sold him originally into slavery. Now, after 13 years of slavery and prison, as I said a few minutes ago, he is second in command of the most powerful nation on earth. 13 years. 13 years of mistreatment. 13 years of misery. 13 years of unfair suffering. 13 years probably of thinking, I never thought my life would turn out like this. I never would have dreamed that my life would turn out like this. For 13 years, he probably thought about that. 13 years of wondering, how can this possibly be God's will for me? Being stuck in a dungeon. I'm not out doing anything for God. Oh, yes, you are. You're in doing something for God. Because we can do for God no matter where we're planted. Even if it isn't our first choice. The maniac from Gadara, who Jesus drove out a legion of demons from, wanted to go with Jesus, begged to go with Jesus and the apostles when they left that area. But Jesus said, no, I want you to stay back here and you be a witness to the people in your city, your hometown. It wasn't his first choice. But he did it. Doesn't matter if it's our first choice or not. Wherever God has you right this second, live for Jesus. Be on fire for Jesus. Do what you can for Jesus starting right now, no matter where you are. And wherever you are later on today, do it there. And wherever you are tomorrow, do it there. You say, but things will never change. Yeah, that's probably what Joseph thought too. And suddenly, things changed a lot. And poor old Joseph, I got to tell you, 13 years of wondering, how can this possibly be God's will? 13 years of, of, of everything except good. But 13 years of everything except good could not break his spirit. Could not break his faith in God. He kept serving the Lord. He kept trusting God concerning the things that he didn't understand. Until he got his breakthrough. And you see it right here. Don't quit on God. Don't give up on God. Don't quit on him. Hang in there with Jesus. Where are you going to go anyway? You going to turn your back on Jesus because you're not getting what you want? You're going you're gonna to burn in hell. Well, that'll do you a lot of good. Just hang in there with Jesus till your breakthrough comes. Verse 47. And in the seven... Plenteous years, the earth brought forth by handfuls. 48. And he gathered up all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Egypt and laid up the food in the cities, the food of the field, which was round about every city 
lady up in the same. Joseph is giving the orders. And one of the commands was for storage facilities to be built in every area of Egypt. And this was such a smart thing on his part. Good idea. Because when the seven-year famine hits, it's going to be easier to distribute grain to everyone who needs it. You've already got to divide it up, you see, into different sections of the, of the country. And we see from this that Joseph has been given authority by the king, but we know that all authority comes from God. So ultimately, he was given this authority by God, and he's using it to serve the best interest of people. That's the reason that God gives you authority or anyone else authority. Whatever authority we have, maybe it's just authority over ourselves, maybe we're alone. Whatever authority we have should be used to honor God and benefit others in some way, as well as ourselves. The authority that God distributes to his people is the authority to serve others, to help, not abuse. And that's at, that's at any level of authority we may, be, we may have. Verse 49. And Joseph gathered corn as the sand of the sea, very much, until he left numbering, for it was without number. Well, at first, Joseph kept an inventory of all the grain that he stored. He kept careful books. But after a while, he thought, forget it. We have more than we can count. And so he stopped doing it. It, it just didn't pay. He had to adjust his, he had to adjust what he was doing. Do you ever notice that life involves adjustments? Life involves adjustments for God's people. If we knew everything like God does, then we would never have to make any adjustments. Then we would never have to make any different plans. But we don't know everything. Often, when circumstances change, we have to change our plans. Or sometimes, when we get more information, we have to change our plans. Or what we say is true. And there are some people who don't like that. There are some people I have experienced, there are some people who think that as a Bible teacher or in the past as a pastor, I, I should know everything about everything and I can never change. And I can never adjust what I teach. And I can never change anything different. Listen, I've, I've changed what I've, I've taught. I hope I do, man. I, I'm a lot smarter now, I hope, than I was 37 years ago when I first started studying the Bible. And you learn a little something going through the entire Bible verse by verse three times. And of course you're going to see things differently. The Holy Spirit is always teaching us, all of us. And only a stubborn fool is going to remain stiff-necked and inflexible and refuse to say that they were ever wrong about something. I would never do that. I fear God. I fear God way too much to not admit it when I'm wrong, to not admit that I have to change what I'm teaching. And it's not a great big thing. I mean, obviously you got the, you got the essentials down about Jesus and salvation and heaven and hell and judgment and all those sorts of things and, and the absolute authority of Scripture and the inerrancy of Scripture. I mean, the major things don't change because they're crystal clear in the Bible. But there are other things that aren't quite so clear and you got to do a little bit more studying. So I changed my position on the rapture of the church and lost 70% of my income about six, seven years ago. I knew it was going to be bad. I didn't think it was going to be that bad, but I knew it was going to be bad when I made the change because those people were all brought up with that, not by me, by, by others. And it's almost like a cult. 
If you don't believe in the pre-tribulation rapture of the church, then you don't believe the Bible. I don't know how many times I heard that. That's just the biggest bunch of baloney I've ever heard in my life. I'm not going to get into that, but I'm, what I'm trying to say is only a stubborn fool will remain stiff-necked and inflexible. When change is demanded, when truth demands change, only someone who can't admit being imperfect won't change when change is called for. And, and Joseph had a great plan. He's taking inventory, man, everything. He had it all numbered. Well, he changed. Verse 50. And unto Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came, which Aseneth, the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of An, bare unto him. And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for God said, He hath made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. Ah, this is so good. You know that God is big enough to deliver anyone from being a slave to bad memories? And all who need that should allow him to do that for them. You don't need to go to some psychologist and pay 150 bucks an hour or whatever it is. You don't need to go to some Christian counselor for years and years until the insurance money runs out. What in the world did the church do for 1950 years before we had psychology? I don't know, but we sure did all right. Oh, you got to heal your, your past memories. Oh, yes, yes, yes. You know, people don't even talk in those terms. Joseph didn't talk in those terms. He just let God happen, do it. Why are you even thinking about that? Why is that even an issue? Why don't you just draw closer to Jesus and have him take care of that business? Because that's the way it works. And there is no other way. There is no shortcut. There is no psychological solution. Sorry, but there isn't. The Word of God is sufficient. The Holy Spirit is sufficient. I'll, I'll say that till my dying breath because I know it's true. It's been true for 2,000 years. It's true today. Joseph was so... Joseph... Joseph was a man who had a horrible past and it could have ruined his present. But God saved him from that. You know how? Joseph was so on fire for Almighty God. Joseph was so occupied with serving God and doing what he had to do that he didn't have the time or the interest or the energy to dwell on the unfair things that happened to him in the past. And that is the only thing that will work with you. It's true. I don't care what it is. It's true. If it can't be solved by the Word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, it can't be solved. The best way to avoid being a slave, the only way to, to avoid being a slave of the past and avoid the, the bitterness that often accompanies it is to be full of God, full of the Word of God, prayed up and busy doing the things that need to be done right now, today. You say, that's too simplistic. You're out of your mind. Anybody who says that's too simplistic, I'll come right back at them and say, you're into neo-evangelicalism. You're into modern evangelicalism, not the Word of God. It is not simplistic. Simple? Oh, yeah, it's simple. But God's ways are simple. Like one guy says, God keeps the cookies on the lower shelf where the kids can get them. His ways are simple, but they are not simplistic. Verse 52. And the name of the second called he Ephraim, for God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Thirteen years of bad resulted in God making Joseph fruitful. None of it was good. On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being good, the previous 13 years had been a zero. It was all bad. But God brought good out of it, and Joseph is better because of it. When it comes to spiritual fruit, when it comes to spiritual character, 
like holiness and humility and patience, bad times are like fertilizer. But you must endure them by drawing closer to Jesus. Joseph had been filled with fertilizer. And right now, he's looking very good because of it. Verse 53. And the seven years of plenteousness that was in the land of Egypt were ended, and the seven years of dearth began to come, according as Joseph had said. And the dearth was in all the lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. How about that? No crops were growing anywhere, including in Egypt, Syria, Arabia, Canaan, Palestine, Egypt. None of those places were producing crops, but Egypt had food because they had Joseph who had the word of God, and the word of God makes all the difference in the world. 55. And when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said unto all the Egyptians, Go, go unto Joseph. And what he saith you do. What he saith to you do. And this is where Joseph's walk with God will really start to pay off for the people. Right here. They were on the verge of starving. But if they listen to Joseph, who's following the word of God, they'll be okay. And that's, that's the key to blessing. You know, when you have godly leadership at any level, leaders who are sold out to Jesus Christ and led by the word of God and aren't, aren't, aren't afraid to proclaim it in spite of risks to themselves, you got people who are willing to submit to the word of God and honor godly leadership, plus you have godly leadership, you got a formula for blessing. And that's what's happening right here. 56. And the famine was over all the face of the earth, and Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold unto the Egyptians, and the famine waxed sore in the land of Egypt. And all countries came into Egypt to Joseph for to buy corn, because that the famine was so sore in all the lands. People traveled from all over the world, really, to get food from the only place that had it, and that was Egypt. And I doubt that anybody was fussy about what they were eating. They were happy to get grain. You know, isn't it true that when food is plentiful, Sometimes people complain if the meat's a little tough, you know, or, or the eggs are a little too hard, or, you know, maybe they have to eat the same old thing two days in a row. But when food is scarce, people are happy to get whatever they can. No one appreciates good more than the one who has had to live with bad. No one appreciates forgiveness through Jesus Christ like the one who understands that they are dead in their sins and hell-bound without a Savior. Thank God for His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who sets us free from sin and from hell. What a lesson Joseph is for us, isn't he? He hung in there with Jesus. He hung in there with God. He hung in there with the Word of God. He clinged to it, even when it didn't seem like it was going to ever come to pass. He did it. And boy, is he blessed now. And the hard times he went through because he kept seeking the Lord worked to make him a better person. Don't waste trouble by not causing it to draw you closer to Jesus. A lot of times people squander, they despise God's discipline by complaining about their trouble or by turning their back on Jesus or by looking for the human element in their trouble and focusing on that. Just forget it. It's there. It's God's chastisement. Draw closer to Jesus because of it and you'll be better equipped to be used by him now and in the future. And I'm out of time. You can study the Word of God further at the Scripture Verse by Verse website, which can be found at thebibleversebyverse.com. Check it out at thebibleversebyverse.com. Begin a verse-by-verse -verse study from Genesis through Revelation, one verse at a time. All you have to do is click on the book you want to study, click on the chapter, open your Bible, follow along, and listen as I teach it verse-by-verse, -verse, just like I did today. Again, that's found at thebibleversebyverse.com. I do hope you check it out. 
I do hope you begin a verse-by-verse study of God's Word because there's nothing more important in all the world than the Word of God. And if the Word of God is a blessing to you, would you please keep in mind that I'm not underwritten by a large church or denomination. I've been doing this for over 30 years, and it's always been a faith ministry. I've never received a regular salary. I've always just did what God wanted me to do the way He wanted me to do it, preach the Word of God as clearly as I can, and trust that those who are blessed, those who are hungry for the truth, although they're a remnant, I know they are, those that are hungry for the truth will help support this ministry. You can give in a secure method at the thebibleversebyverse.com. Just click on the donate button at the top of the front page and give as the Lord may lead. lead. And please pray for this ministry. And please, whatever you do, study the Word of God. Stay in the Word. Stay in prayer. Until next time, Michael Moret for Scripture Verse by Verse. So long, everyone.